What a great day. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that I've got the opportunity to visit Israel. Um, before I start, I want to be clear that this talk is, uh, like, very few of these are my ideas. In fact, I don't think these are my ideas at all. Perhaps the only novel thing that I'm presenting to you here is the composition of them. And in preparing for this talk, I've been thinking a lot about uh, my own body of work, like the things that I, I think about and things that I like to write, to write about. Um, and the one word summary of it would be, you know, how should I write good code? Like, that's the question. And the thing is that, like, we're all here at this conference to, to come to, like, because we ask the same question. We want to um, write good code. We want to write good code because, well, actively, nobody, nobody in their right mind would sit down and study and say, I want to be bad. I want to do a terrible job. I want to be worse than anybody else. I want to make this my life's goal to be very bad at what I do. So obviously, we want to be good. But in the continuum between good things and bad things, like we have to know. We have to have some, some kind of sign. Like we have to know if there's bad code and good code, what defines good? What are its properties? What are the attributes of good code? Um, what are its hallmarks? How, how can we recognize it? What are its patterns? What are its idioms? And this, of course, brings me to our lovely word of idiomatic go. To say something is idiomatic is to say that it follows the style of the time. To say that something is not idiomatic is to say the opposite. It says it's not following the prevailing style. It is not fashionable. More importantly, to say to someone else that their code is not idiomatic is to say they're not fashionable, is to say that they're not following the current trend, the current style. But we don't explain why. And like all important truths, the answer is right here in the dictionary. An idiom is a group of words established by usage, by usage, as having a meaning that is not deducible from those individual words. So I can tell you something, and, you, and it's not clear from what I'm saying, what I mean. So idiomatic go is not something that you can learn from a book. Well, not directly, any more than you can learn an idiom from these words on the page. It's something that you acquire from being part of a group, from being part of a community. And so therefore, idioms are hallmarks of shared values. And the concern I have with this is in many ways, idiomatic go can be an exclusionary term. It can exclude people. It's like saying, you can't sit with us. I mean, isn't that what we mean when we say to somebody else that, oh, the code, it's, um, I'm okay, like, I see that you tried, but it's not very idiomatic. They didn't do it right, it didn't look right, it doesn't follow the style of the time. And so idiomatic go is not a suitable mechanism for teaching people how to write good code. Because it's defined fundamentally in telling them they did it wrong. Wouldn't it be better if the advice that we gave to people um, didn't alienate them right at the point when they were most, uh, most interested in succeeding? Like, what if the way that we taught people how to write that good, code, good code was not by telling them they did it wrong? So I want to step away from this problematic idea of idiomatic code and ask, well, what other cultural artifacts do we as Go programmers have? Um, perhaps we can look at Rob Pike's Go Proverbs. These wonderful proverbs. And we can say, are these suitable teaching tools? Will these tell us how to write good Go code? And in general, I don't think so. Um, and that's to be very, very clear, especially as I'm on camera, that I'm not dismissing Rob's work. And nor am I dismissing um, uh, Kensuku's original Go proverbs, which, was, which were the inspiration of it. It's just that proverbs 
are these little pithy sayings. They're kind of like, like, like repeating a general truth or a piece of advice. Um, and again, to understand them, you need to kind of have the context. You need to already be in the tribe. Now, the goal of the, of the Proverbs is to reveal a deeper truth about the design of the language. But really, how useful as a teaching tool is a statement like, see go is not go, or the empty interface tells us nothing. To someone who's coming to go from a language which uh, looks nothing like that, like maybe they're not using, using a compiled language, maybe the interfaces work differently in their language, maybe they don't have embedding and structural typing. So it's not that the proverbs are not useful, it's just a, as a tool for the majority of people, and in any growing community, the majority of people will be the newcomers. They're perhaps not the most useful teaching tool. Now, there's a fellow called Dan Liu, um, who occasionally makes a splash on the internet, and one of the things that he had linked from his website was this really old presentation by uh, a gentleman called Mark Lukowski, who uh, it was about the engineering culture in the kind of Windows, Windows development group around the Windows NT timeframe. And the reason I bring it up here is that this is Lukowski's de description of a culture, of an engineering culture. It's a, it's a common way of evaluating designs, of making trade-offs, of making decisions. And there are many, many ways of discussing culture. I mean, there's, there's entire fields of study at university and cultural studies about this, but with respect to an engineering culture, a set of values that we hold between engineers, I think the description that Lukowski has is very apt. The idea here is that your values guide your decisions when you don't know what to do. They guide you in an unknown design space. Now, of course, these are highly culturally specific, like they're not transportable between cultures, between groups, but that doesn't mean they're not valuable. Maybe one way of saying engineering values are, this is the way that we do things around here. For example, in Lukowski's presentation, the NT group's values were portability, reliability, security, and extensibility. These were their four goals for Windows NT. And so these were so ingrained in the team, everybody knew them, like, like they would be quizzed and like, name the, name the four values, portability, reliability, security, extensibility, like just like top quiz. And it meant that every decision they made, from scheduling to how to design a feature to how to respond to a bug, was made in the context of these values. So the subtext of this talk could be, what are the engineering values of Go? What are the core beliefs or the philosophies that define the way that we as Go, pro Go programmers interpret the world? How do we promulgate those beliefs? How do we teach them? How do we enforce them? And most importantly, how do we change them over time? Because communities have to evolve over time. So how was you, how were you, hopefully some of you in the audience as newly minted Go programmers, how are you going to, how are you being calculated with these engineering values? And more importantly, and just as importantly, how will perhaps some of the rest of you in here as seasoned Go programmers, how will you promulgate the engineering values that you like to see on your, on your projects to future generations of Go programmers? And to just make this point crystal clear, this process of knowledge transfer is not optional. Without new blood, without, without it, our community will wither, will become diseased and wither, will become inward looking and ultimately irrelevant. It's crucial to bring new developers and new ideas into any community. Okay, to set the scene for what I'm getting at, perhaps we can look at other languages and look for examples of their engineering values. For example, C++ and by extension Rust, what is their core value? It's up there on the screen. Don't pay for what you don't use. This is one of the, this is one of the, the cornerstones of their decision making. If your program doesn't use some computationally expensive feature, then you mustn't pay for it. That's, that is the design maxim of C++. And this value extends from the language itself to its standard library, 
to, and it's used as a yardstick for um, judging other projects written in C++. They're considered negligent or profligate if they use, uh, if they accidentally trigger features which uh, have even the slightest overhead. This, this is this core belief if you don't pay for what you don't use um, defines this community. In Java, in Ruby, in Smalltalk, probably other, other languages, the core value that everything is an object drives the design of programs to be designed around message passing, information hiding, and polymorphism. We can argue later about what OO means. That's what it means to me. Designs that shoehorn like a procedural style or God forbid a functional style into languages like this are considered wrong. Like you didn't use enough objects. That's too procedural. I don't understand what that that is. Like like you have too many you have too many static static functions. Where are the objects? Or as we would say, it's not idiomatic. It's not an idiomatic Java or Ruby or Smalltalk. So turning to our community, what are the values that bind us? Now, I've spent some time in the Go community, um, and I, I don't think that it is uh, incorrect for me to say that when it comes to discourse in our community, it can often be fractious. And so developing a set of values from first principles, like doing this from the ground up, would be a formidable challenge. Um, but it's important because consensus is critical. Like they can't just be, uh, they can't just be uh, uh, dictated. Um, but that brings in its own challenges. That it's as the number of contributors to that discussion increases, so does the difficulty in, in creating consensus. But what if, what if somebody had done the hard work for us? And so, as you probably guessed from the title of this talk. Um, a gentleman by the name of Tim Peters sat down 20-something years ago, I think, getting, getting onto that, and wrote one of the... Uh, Python has a, a proposal format they call PEP, Python Enhancement Proposals, roughly mirrored after internet RFCs. And so RFCs, actually, some of them are drafts, some of them are just commentaries, some of them are, um, well, the, the, April, the April Fool's RFCs uh, <laughs> have, have no practical purpose. So, so th th there's a long tradition in Python in... You know, like it's basically I'm writing a memo. And so that was what PEP20 was. It was the Zen of Python. And what Peters was attempting to do was write down the engineering values that he saw in Guido Van Rossi. He was trying to extract, uh, perhaps either Guido wasn't able to express them or perhaps this was just his observation, that these are the, these are the engineering values or the truths of writing Python. And in true Python style, some of them don't make a lot of sense. Some of them are kind of self-referential. Um, the page actually says, I have, these are 20 items, but I've only written 19 of them down. So there's, um, that, that there's a little bit of Python in humor there. Um, and so for the rest of this talk, what I want to try and do is look at these values, look at some of them and ask, is there anything that can teach us about Go? Let's start with something spicy. This one's got an exclamation point, we'll start there. Namespaces are one hon honking great idea. Let's do more of these. I mean, this, this is pretty unequivocal. Python programmers, Peters is arguing, should use namespaces a lot, exclamation point. Now, in Go parlance, a namespace is what we call a package. I doubt there's any question that grouping things into packages is good for design and potentially good for reuse. I doubt anyone would argue with me on that point. But there might be some confusion, especially if you're coming, uh, uh, coming with a decade of experience from another language which uh, uses their kind of modularity or their packaging or their namespacing slightly different. Um, you, might be, you might be wondering, well, what is the right way to do it in Go? As I'm sure everyone has heard me argue at some point, every package should have a purpose. Everything should have a purpose, and every package should have a purpose. And the best way to know what a, what a package's purpose is, is its name. It should have a good name, it should be descriptive. Names and nouns. The package's name should describe what it provides, its purpose. 
So to reinterpret Peter's words, every Go package should have a single purpose. Now, this is not a new idea, as I said. I've been banging on about this for a while. But the question you should be asking is, why, why is this way of arranging code better than like the Java or Ruby approach, which is based more on building a very detailed taxonomy of types? Why, you ask? I argue, because change. Change is the name of the game at the end of the day. It's what we do here. What we do as programmers is we manage change. When we do it well, we call it architecture. We call it design. When we do it badly, well, we call it legacy code. Or we call it technical debt. But fundamentally, change is what we do here. Now, if you're writing a program that works perfectly the first time, has one fixed set of requirements that never change, and only has one, one input, Nobody cares that code is good or bad because ultimately the output of that program is all the business cares about. If you only run it once for one input, people, people couldn't care less. But this is not how we write software. This is not why we write software. Software has bugs, requirements change, the input you run your program against changes. And it's more likely that someone else, um, uh, it's more likely that because of this, you'll be asked to fix the program, to change the program, to enhance it, to make it do something new that it didn't do before, to make it respond to a new set of inputs that weren't previously envisaged. And maybe it's you'll have to do it, and maybe it's, or maybe it's somebody else, but somebody has to maintain this code. So that leads to the question of how we're going to make this change easy, how we're going to make this change possible. What techniques can we use? Should we have interfaces everywhere? Should we mock everything? Should we reach into the Java bag of tricks and use aspect-oriented programming? Should be dependency, dependency inversion, dependency injection? Maybe. Maybe for some class of programs, yes. But for most programs, designing up something up front to be flexible is over-engineering. This is the very definition of Yagni. So what if we take the position that rather than enhancing components, changing them over time, we just replace them? And if we make those units small enough, that replacement is not a great deal of work lost. It's just the regular churn. Maybe that's the way to do it. And the best way to know when something needs to be replaced is when it doesn't do what its name says. You don't, you, you, you don't drive cars on water, you drive boats. So a good package starts by choosing a good name. And you think of your package name as one word elevator pitch. You have, you have one second to explain to somebody what your idea is when you meet them in the elevator. And you have that one word is your package's name. And when that name no longer matches the requirements, that's time to find a replacement. So back to Python. Pep20 says simple is better than complex. And I couldn't agree more. A couple of years ago, I made this tweet. It kind of like occurred to me that, and certainly at the time I was thinking about it, most programming languages start out trying to be simple. Like that's always their leading, their leading statement. But most just stand up settling for just being powerful. Um, here's Ruby, here's the, the Ruby website. Simplicity, a language with a focus on simplicity and productivity. Swift. Our goals are ambitious. We want to make a programming simple, things easy, and difficult things possible. Here's Elm. Elm is a virtual DOM implementation designed for simplicity and speed. And of course, our own favorite website. Open source programming language that makes it easy to build simple, reliable, efficient software. But as I was researching this talk, um, I was a little bit unnerved to discover that simplicity is not a core value. I don't know if you can make that out there, but like the word simple is not found. Um, and this, this is perhaps a little bit facetious. Like, to be honest, I didn't go through every single page there, but it's not like they're, they're masthead. And the thing was that as I looked into this, it got worse. Like Python, the language that we're talking about here, simple is not found on the front page. Um, not found here either. Although that, that's, that's probably just salty. So maybe that's a cheap shot. 
Or it could be that either these languages aren't simple, or perhaps more importantly, they don't think of themselves as being simple. They don't consider simplicity to be a core value. Now call me old fashioned, but when did being simple fall out of style? Now, if you think about it, while it, it's somewhat unnerving to turn off a bunch of languages that don't think of themselves as simple, I have never seen anybody launch a new language and said, this is more complex than anything that's come before it. The levels of complexity that will be achieved by my new language will be monumental. Of course not, that's preposterous. But many languages start out with this goal of being simple. But as we saw, they kind of along the way they fail. They, they, they stop being simple and they just fall back onto notions of, well, we can't be simple, we'll, we'll, we'll be powerful. Like, like, like that expressiveness, you know, it's not very simple, but geez, it's powerful. Um, so whether Python abides by this mantra of simplicity is certainly a matter for debate, and I'll leave that to others. But we know here that for Go, we hold simplicity as a core value. In, Tony Hall writes in The Emperor's New Clothes that there are two ways of constructing software. One is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. The other way is to make it so complex that there are no obvious deficiencies. And importantly, he says, the first method is far more difficult because we know that simple doesn't mean easy. We know that. It's often more work to make something simple than to build the easy thing. Dijkstra says, simplicity is a prerequisite for reliability. Why should we strive for simplicity? Why is it important that Go programs be simple? Because, as Brian Koenigan says, controlling complexity is the essence of computer programming. Because simple doesn't mean crude. It means reliable and maintainable. And simple doesn't mean unsophisticated. It means reliable, readable, understandable. I think we can all agree that when it comes to Go, simple code is preferable to clever code. Now, Peter's writes in PEP20 that explicit is better than implicit. And um, I, I kind of think that this is a place where he was being more aspirational than factual. Um, there are many things in Python which are not explicit. Um, decorators, double under methods, uh, generators. I mean, they're all powerful. There's a reason that they exist. Like every feature that somebody put the time into, uh, into implementing a language was important to them. It was worth their time to add it, especially the complicated ones. But heavy use of those features makes it harder for the reader to predict the cost of operations. But the good news is that we have a choice. We have a choice as Go programmers to choose to make our code explicit. Now, explicit could mean many things to many people. And perhaps you're, you're, you're saying, oh, Dave's saying explicit. What he actually means is, you know, very verbose or, um, or long-winded or bureaucratic. I mean, he's, he's not boring. He's just explicit. Um, but that's a superficial... That's a superficial interpretation. It's a misnomer to focus only on the syntax of the page, to like fret about things like line lengths and drying up, uh, drying up expressions. More valuable, in my opinion, the places to be explicit is when it comes to state, and specifically the coupling between state. Because coupling is a measure of the amount that one thing depends on another thing. Um, there are other words like connaissance and efferent versus afferent coupling. They're not important. The simple thing to say is if two things are tied together tightly, they move together. This is a train coupling. It's the thing that connects the carriages on a train. And when they're coupled together, where the engine goes, the carriages follow. They don't have a choice. So why does coupling matter? Because just like the, the train carriages, when you change a piece of code, Everything coupled to it changes as well. We know exactly what that is. That's I upgraded to a new version of the library and it broke my build. A prime example, yeah, is, is an API change. Now, APIs are an unavoidable point of coupling, but there are many, many more insidious forms of coupling. 
clearly everyone knows that if an API signature changes, um, the data passing into and out of it changes. It's right there in the signature of the function. I take these types, I return those types. But what if an API passed data another way? What if every time you called an API, you got a different result, even though you kept giving it the same input? What would that be like? And this is state. State is the problem in computer science. The management, the ownership, the tracking, the recording, the duplication, all of the things that come with maintaining state. Suppose we have a simple counter package. Um, you can call increment here, and it's going to increment by the number you provide it, and as a side benefit, it's going to return you the, the now resulting count. Um, there's even a nice trick, if you increment by zero, you get the current count value back. Okay, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, suppose you had to test this code. How would you reset that counter after each test? Suppose you wanted to run those tests in parallel. How could you do it? Quite tricky. Now, suppose you wanted to count more than one thing in a program using this, this code. Could you do it? No, of course not. This code has none of those properties. So clearly the answer is to encapsulate that count value in a type. Of course, this, this is exactly how we, we would approach this problem. But the reason I mention, the reason I bring this up is that this problem isn't restricted to trivial counters. Most of the application logic, most of the main application logic inside a program doesn't look like this. It looks like that. A lot of state, a lot of global state retained with very few ways of controlling and paralyzing it and, and compartmentalizing that state. My takeaway from, from this point is we should avoid package level state. Reduce this coupling, reduce the kind of spooky action and distance when one, one method changes a global variable and that affects everybody else that can see it. And instead, provide your dependencies by passing them into your types. Put them as fields on your structs rather than using package level variables. Now back to, pe pep, back to PEP20. It's been said that languages that favor exception handling follow, um, when I was reading, I really like this. Uh, they, exception handling languages follow the samurai principle. Does everyone know what the samurai principle is? Return victorious, victorious or don't return at all. Which I think is a wonderful way of describing languages that use exceptions for control flow. Functions, if, if you're in an exception-based language, your functions only succeed. They only return valid results. If they don't succeed, control flow takes an entirely different path. They always return successfully, or you never hear from them again. Now, obviously, Go is taking a different, a different path. Um, and it's a bit hard to talk about this without exposing my own bias. Um, in my research, unchecked exceptions are clearly an unsafe model to programming. Like, how can you possibly write code that is reliable when every single statement can explode with, a, with an exception. C++ taught us this. Now Java tried to make this, uh, this pattern safer by checked exceptions. But to the best of my knowledge, no language, no mainstream language has repeated Java's checked exceptions, not even C Sharp. So there are plenty of languages which, uh, which use exceptions, but all of them, with the singular exception of Java, do so in the unchecked variety. It's one, one favorite piece of support I used to have was to watch the C++ um, presentations every, every year. And someone would put three lines of code on, like, like in a, a declaring a value and adding one to it. And they would say, is this code safe? And they would spend the next 90 minutes explaining why it's not safe to add one to something. Robust programs are composed from pieces that handle failure cases before they pat themselves on the back and congratulate themselves for doing a job well done. Put another way, we plan for failure, not success. And this is the space that, design, that Go was designed for. Server programs, multi-threaded programs, programs that deal with 
un, uh, unknown input over the network, deal with unexpected data, timeouts, connection phase, corrupted data, all of these things we encounter in our programs. And the reason that Go programs are successful in doing this and why Go is a successful language in this space is the pattern of dealing with the failure before we deal with the success case. We always have to have a plan for failure before we plan for success. And when it comes to the verbosity of everyone's favorite three-line three -line statement, for as tiresome as it can be to type sometimes, the value of this statement is outweighed by the deliberate consideration of handling every error when it happens rather than when it occurs in production. I want to echo um, Peter Bergon's assertion. Um, like in, in, in a way, this statement was actually one of the inspirations for this talk when we were on the Go Time, Go Time podcast talking about try. Peter said, I think that error handling should be explicit. This should be a core value of the language. And I couldn't agree more. Because this leads to programs where failures are handled at the point of writing rather than the point that they occur in production. So, to interpret, um, to interpret Python's words, we should handle errors explicitly. Peters wrote that flat is better than nested. I think this was one of the first, um, the first items in PEP20. Now, this is, uh, this is important advice coming from a language which uses indentation as its primary form of flow control. But how can we interpret this advice for Go? I mean, Go format controls so much of the way that we lay out our code. We don't really have a great deal of flexibility here. Um, I talked a little bit yesterday in the workshop that the only thing we can really control in Go's formatting is how much, vert how much horizontal white space we include, how much vertical white space we include. And I've talked about package names and about um, uh, packaging, like uh, avoiding complicated package hierarchies. Uh, in my experience, the more a programmer tries to subdivide and create a taxonomy of their uh, packages within a Go project, the more they run the risk of creating dead ends and hitting import loops. But I think the best application of uh, Python's advice is that to talk about control flow within a function. Simply put, Try to avoid flow control that requires deep indentation. So flat, we're going to keep the code flat against the left-hand side of the screen. Matt Ryer calls this line of sight coding. So line, this is from his, uh, his post. You can look this up on Medium. Line of sight is a straight line along which the observer has an unobstructed view. And that's what we want. We want to use guard clauses. We want to avoid deep indentation so that the successful path of the code stays on the left-hand side of the screen. It no, at no point is in danger of scrolling off to the right-hand side of the screen. And as a side effect of taking this pattern, you will never ever again in your life have to argue about line lengths for your project because the successful path won't be hidden for, for uh, indentations deep. Because every time you indent, you add another precondition to the programmer's stack in their mind. And you're consuming one of those seven plus or minus two um, slots in their short-term memory. They have to remember, I indented because X was true. I indented again because I'm now in this third case. Rather than nesting deeply, keep that success path of the function as close to the left-hand side of the screen. This, was one of, this is one of the Zen of Pythons. In the face of ambiguity, Refuse the temptation to guess. It's probably one of the most Zen statements there. And it's weird because programming is based on mathematics and logic. You re very rarely hear mathematicians talk about guessing. Yeah, you rarely hear, you rarely hear the mathematic mathematicians talking about the element of chance. But the thing is, there are things that we do as programmers every single day where we guess. What does that variable do? What does that parameter do? What if I don't know a value for that? Do I have to provide it? Is it optional? What happens if I pass nil? Like, is that a problem? What happens if I call register twice? There's actually a lot of guesswork in modern programming, especially when it comes to using libraries that you didn't write. One of the best ways that I know 
to help a programmer to avoid having to guess, especially when you're building an API, is to focus on that default use case. Make it easy for the programmer to do the most common thing. Josh Block, uh, one of the architects of Java, writes, APIs should be easy to use and hard to misuse. Now, I've talked a lot about API design. It's one of my, one of my favorite soapbox topics. And I won't talk any more about there because I actually think there's a better way that we can apply this advice in Python about avoiding, about avoiding guessing, and that is performance. Despite what you might think about Nuth's advice about the evils of optimization, one of the drivers of Go's success is that it's pretty fast. It's reasonably efficient. And that means that people will choose to write in Go because they need those properties. So it's, 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 it's reasonable advice to say, you know, don't optimize performance, you know, avoid, the, avoid the evils of performance. But you have to realize that the reason, the reason that Go is successful is because it is reasonably performant. And so there, and there are a lot of misconceptions about performance. So my request is, when you're looking to performance tune your code, or you're facing some dogmatic advice from somebody, like they, they, must, they might be saying, defer is slow, read this blog post. Seago is too expensive, read this blog post. You must always use Atomics, locked are too expensive. Just stop, and before you, you apply that um, advice blindly, write a benchmark. If you think something is slow, then prove it with a benchmark. I give a day-long workshop. Um, I call it high-performance code, but it, actually I'm not teaching anyone how to write high-performance code. I'm teaching them how to use the tools that come with the Go distribution so that they can find the bottlenecks in their code, because that's the hard part. It's not improving the code. Once you, once you know that is slow, you can rewrite it, but finding it is much harder than, than writing fast code. So if you think something is slow, first prove it with a benchmark. Now, at this point, I think I've probably mined PEP20 for, um, for the valuable points. And I've probably stretched the reinterpretation of their points a little bit beyond good taste. Um, I think that's fine, because like, this is an interesting rhetorical device. It served its purpose. Um, but ultimately, Go and Python are two different languages, although they do actually share um, a common ancestor. So these next two suggestions I'm, uh, I'm going to make, but they don't really have a strong association with Zen or Python. I think we've kind of tapped that out. And they're about concurrency. Because concurrency in Go is like a signature feature, and it's so easy to use. This is from Rob Pike's um, .go talk in 2015. He's talking about the, like, the API for starting a Go routine. You type a G, an O, and a space, and then the function name. And that's it, three keystrokes, and you started a subprocess. It couldn't get much simpler than that. And it is so simple. There's no threads, there's no stack sizes, no thread pool executors, no IDs, no tracking completion status. It's pretty simple. And Go routines are really cheap too. They're certainly much cheaper than threads because they're designed that way. It's designed, the Go runtime will easily hold up hundreds of thousands into the millions of Go routines without breaking a sweat. And this is important because it opens up designs that wouldn't be practical in other concurrency models, that wouldn't be possible in a threaded model, or wouldn't really work in an invented callback model. But as cheap as Go routines are, they can't ever be free. So even if something costs a small amount, when you're talking on the order of 10 to the 6 Go routines, those costs start to add up. And again, this is not to say you shouldn't use millions of Go routines if that's what the program requires. But if that's what your design requires, then it is important to keep track of those millions of Go routines because in aggregate, they're going to consume a non-trivial amount of resources. And I'm just talking about the memory that a Go routine uses, like its little, its little stack. To be useful, a Go routine has to do something, and that generally means it holds a resource. And when I mean a resource, I mean a lock, a network connection, a buffer with some data in it, the sending end of a channel. These are all resources. And while that Go routine is alive, the lock is going to be held, network connection maintained, maintained open, the buffer has a reference, so it's going to be retained. And, this, and the receivers on that channel are going to keep waiting for things to be received. And the simplest way to free those resources is to tie their lifetime to the lifetime of their Go routine. 
when the Garotene exits, the resources are freed, either through the either through the work of the garbage collector or through defer. So while it's near trivial to start a go routine, before you write out those three little letters, the G, the O, and the space, make sure you have an answer for these questions. First of all, under what condition will a go routine stop? We don't have a way to tell a go routine to exit. There is no stop function, there's no kill function, and there's a good reason for that. So if we can't command a go routine to stop, all we can do is ask it politely. You say, please. And how, how do you ask a go routine politely? This almost always comes down to a channel operation. This is how we communicate between go routines. We want to avoid spin, spinning. Generally, you use a channel and you close that channel. And that's the signal that a go routine, uh, a go routine, a go routine can use to recognize when it's being asked to stop. Next question is, what is required for that condition to arise? If we're using a channel to communicate this shutdown, who's going to send that signal? Who's going to close that channel? When will that happen? Possibly there's a chain of go routines all connected together. So you have to ask the question, well, I close when they close their end, and they close when they close their end, and you have to keep answering that question up the chain. And the last one, is what signal will you use to know that the go routine has stopped? Because while we, while we all understand we can signal a go routine to stop by closing a channel, the actual act of it stopping and completing happens in the future from the point of view of the original go routine. Now, this might happen very, very quickly in terms of our human perception, but computers execute billions of operations a second. And from their point of view, each of those go routines is unsynchronized, they move in their own frame of reference. So it's not simply enough to say, I close the channel and it'll be stopping soon, because soon is a relative statement. So before you launch a go routine, know when it will stop. And continuing on the idea of managing individual go routines, I'd like to, it's likely that any, in any serious go program, you will use, be more than using more than one go routine. So there's some concurrency involved. And this raises the problem, um, many libraries and code will write fall into this one go routine per connection. You accept a connection, you run off a go routine to manage it. That's kind of the worker pattern. Now HTTP is a really good example of this. Shutting down the server that can hold the listening socket is relatively straightforward, you just close the socket. But what about all the go routines spawned, accepted, handling connections that came from that listing socket. Now, NetHTTP does provide a way you get a context subject, which you can get out of the request, and you can use that to get a kind of cancel signal. So it is possible to signal those go routines that they should stop, but it is more difficult to know when they have actually acknowledged that signal. There really isn't a way to do that in NetHTTP. And just to be just to be clear, if Brad's watching, I do tend to pick on NetHTTP a lot. And this is not because I think it is bad. It is tremendously successful. NetHTTP is one of the standout um, APIs. It's been with us forever, and it has it is shone, shone through. And it's because a piece of code that's lived for a long time has had to evolve. And its shortcomings have kind of been thoroughly picked over. Every possible edge case of the HTTP server package has been investigated, prodded, probed, and kind of re um, reimagined. So this is, it's not, um, you should think of this not as criticism, but as flattery. So one of the, one of the problems here is that there is, there is a way to signal a go routine to stop, but no way to know when it is finished. And this is important when you're building libraries, because if your library spins off a go routine, it would be really useful for the caller to know, to be able to track the lifetime of that go routine. And so this, com this comes back to the advice. Leave concurrency to the caller. Rather than, rather than uh, those go statements living inside your function and just spawning off, spawning off a worker, write your functions to work synchronously. And if the caller wants them to run asynchronously, they can use that go statement outside it because that puts them in a position to track the lifetime of that go routine with channels and weight groups and all that good stuff.
Now, perhaps you were hoping that you'd be able to leave today without me ranting at you about testing. Sadly, today is not that day. Write tests to lock in the behavior of your packages API. Whether you do TDD, whether you do test first, test afterwards, I don't care. The goal is your tests are the contract about what your software does and does not do. Unit tests at the package level lock in the behavior that your API guarantees to people. It's the observable behavior. And the thing is they describe in code, not documentation or specs or email messages or Slack discussions. They, de they describe in code what your, what your API promises to do. This is the contract that you can assert that your API did what it did yesterday and will do what it, what it promises tomorrow. And all you have to do is run go test. At any stage, you can know with a high degree of confidence that the behavior people relied on before you changed that code, before you refactored, before you added a new functionality, before you extracted some common functionality, keeps working after your change. Test lock in your API behavior. Any change that uh, refactors the, the internals to your package must include a change that tests and they should, that should, over time, improve the coverage. We're getting close to the end. Go, Go is a simple language. We only have 20-something keywords. Um, and, that, and that means that kind of the features that we do have kind of stand out. Like, like the language offers is fairly Spartan, so the things that it does offer us um, kind of stand out. Now, I was going to say, I think all of us, but I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to project onto you. I'm just going to talk about myself. Um, I've experienced in, in my journey through Go the confusion that comes from trying to use all of Go's features at once. I mean, who, who, was, who was so excited to use channels when they first came to language that used channels for everything, for everything they could? Like, everything's going to communicate with the channel. I'm taking the, the smattering of laughter and someone who raised their hand at the back there, that I'm not the only one who did this. And personally, I found the result was hard to test, it was fragile, ultimately overcomplicated. Over I think there's kind of general, gen general agreement there. I had the same experience with GoRoutines. I attempted to break all the work into teeny tiny units and run them in their own GoRoutines and ultimately missed the observation that a lot of that work was actually serial. While I could put it all into their own GoRoutines and set up this web of communication, fundamentally, they were usually waiting on their neighbor to give them results. So that was actually serial operation. And so again, the result was there was a lot of complexity for little benefit and certainly no parallelism. Has anyone experienced that? Has anyone felt that in their initial use of, like when they were learning Go, they kind of went a little bit overboard with Go routines? Maybe? Um, I had the same experience with embedding. Initially, I mistook it for inheritance. And that meant I recreated the fragile base class problem by composing bigger and bigger types together, like these big mega types with all this behavior. Um, and obviously, the result was this complicated and very brittle, brittle mess, as anyone who's experienced uh, the fragile base problem in uh, inheritance based languages. So, moderation is a virtue. Like, as, as a piece of advice, um, it's possibly the least actionable. But I think it's important enough to mention anyway because the story is always the same. Go responds well to using its features in moderation. If you can, don't reach for a Go routine or a channel or embed a struct or use an anonymous function or go overboard with packages and interfaces for everything. Rather prefer a simpler approach. Like when you have a choice, choose to actually not use one of those features to make it simpler. And I want to close with one final item from PEP20. Peters writes, readability counts. And so much has been written and spoken about the importance of readability, not just in Go, but for all programming languages. It is a common topic. People like me stand on stages like this, advocating, advocating a lot of words to pitch Go to people. We use like words like simplicity and readability and clarity and productivity. But ultimately, these are all synonyms for one word, maintainability. Because maintainability counts. 
The real goal is to write maintainable code, code that lives on after the original author, code that can exist, not just as a point in time investment, but as foundation for future value. Go isn't a language where we optimize for clever one-liners. We don't optimize for the least lines, lines in a program. We're not optimizing for the source code on disk. We're not even optimizing for how long it takes to type it in. Rather, we want to optimize the code to be clear to the reader, because it's the reader who's going to have to maintain this code. Now, if you're writing a program for yourself, maybe the only, it only has to run once, maybe you're the only person who'll ever see it, then just do whatever works for you. That's fine. But it is a piece of software that more than one programmer has to use, more than one programmer has to contribute, um, or it'll be used by a long enough period of time that the requirements are going to change, um, or, maybe, or more commonly, the environment in which it runs is going to change, then your goal must be for that software to be maintainable. Because if software can't be maintained, then it's going to be rewritten. You know that. You've all got jobs rewriting somebody else's software. And, that, and the, the truth here is that one day that software could be written in Go, and somebody could be rewriting that in another language. So if software can't be maintained, it will be rewritten. And that could be the last time that your company invests in Go. So the takeaway from this point is, can the thing that you worked hard to build be maintained once you're gone? What can you do today? Ask yourself, Every time you send that PR, what can I do today to make it easier for someone to maintain that code tomorrow? And thank you. I'm going to leave you on that message. Thank you so much. <laughs>